Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we're going to learn about multiple approaches to employment development, and we're going to act. We're going to assess strategies for max, maximizing the efficient use of these resources in providing that employment development service to eligible participants. So let's start with what is job development? I mean, that's a good place to start, right? We need to know what we're talking about if we're going to go down that path. You're going to hear me use multiple, in multiple different words. There's going to be job development, employment development, career development, all means the same thing getting somebody a job or developing that job for a person. <clears throat> so job development is the process of self-knowledge, exploration, and decision-making that shapes a person's career. If you think about your own career, did you get, how did you get to where you're at today? Just something to reflect on. Nobody needs to say anything. I was lucky. I, I was dang lucky um, in my career. So I don't know if there's a lot of navigating or, or decision making for me that I can take credit for. I think there was something else out there that was helping me. <clears throat> you know, the, there's a lot of training that suits one's personality, skills, and traits and interests. If, if we if we force somebody into a position that they're not interested in, or they don't feel like it fits what they need to have, you know, in their life, they're not going to be successful. They won't stay there. So we're looking at you know, job placement, it's a combination of counseling, medication, uh, self-help groups, maybe some other support services. We have a lot of people with multiple disabilities that need multiple layers of support. So when we look at job placement and inclusion, that has to be that holistic approach. We have to address all of those different things in that approach. We need to be, we need to be asking, why should an employer hire your participant? What do they bring to the table? So many times when I'm working with people and they're learning how to do job development, they come to the table with all the clients' limitations or all the participants' limitations. That's where they start developing that position is we need to have this in place. We need to have that in place. I want to challenge you guys to start thinking in the other direction. What does that participant bring to the table? What skills and abilities does this individual possess that makes them effective in that position? How can that person benefit or in, in, empower that, that employer, employer or that business? Then challenges faced uh, by participants with mental health diagnosis. <clears throat> this, really, this really is a difficult one because there, there's very significant barriers when it comes to mental health diagnoses. There's always that that stigma of a mental health diagnosis, the co-occurring disabilities that come with that mental health diagnosis. Are they self-medicating another hidden disability that nobody knows about? Addiction is, is one of the big ones that we see people using as a self-medication tool for trauma or pain or chronic back pain, you know, that type of thing. What, how do we um, address that? How do we work around it? Another big barrier for, for people with mental health diagnosis is, is the poor work history. They jump around a lot because they can't, they can't handle that one place or that one um, employment setting to, to maintain or gain longevity. So there's a lot of things that we have to look at when we're moving into developing a position with a company for our participants. We're going to talk real quick about duties and roles of the employment specialist. Now, um, this information and, and the stuff that I have uh, developed with other projects through our employment handbook all comes from the employment specialist role. There's been a couple projects that have actually, in, in rewriting the grant, included employment specialists in that position. So as we go through this, I want you to think about having to wear different hats, especially if you're a project that doesn't have those positions already built in in the, in the proposal language, we're gonna have to wear different hats. So we initiate and maintain ongoing personal contacts with a variety of businesses. You're the front face, you're the one that you walk into the business, they recognize you, you have to develop that relationship and that rapport. You're making contact with potential employers Explain you, you have to explain the benefits and the employment support services available. So we've got to have an elevator speech handy. 
you got to know what VR can provide and can't provide in the supports needed. You are always searching for job leads. So it's it's not, you know, the old style was go to the, just go to the tarot office or go talk to my cousin in, in the tribe. And, and we're seeing that that is running out. We, we need to start developing a network. And that's a whole nother training that we we're, we're developing is, is the business service liaison training. You have to locate jobs for participants who are job ready. What does job ready mean? That's a question I want you guys just to have in the back of your mind. What's job ready mean? Collects data from the employers related to job orders. So what 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 are they? What is that employer needing? What job uh, skills are are they needing to uh, have filled in their business? You need to match those job skills with participants' qualifications. So you need to know your people. You need to know what they bring to the table. Then you then you're also re, a point of referral for participants to employers. You also then need to be the follow-up person. You need to make sure that individual went out and talked to that employer. <clears throat> you got to be keeping your, your fingers on the pulse of the labor market in your area. Now, really, for a lot of us in rural reservation settings, that's not too difficult. There might be one or two jobs open up a month. So it, it's not. But if, if you're expanding your employment search to border towns or or you know, urban areas, then yeah, you need to be really up to date on that labor market and what's happening. One of the big things that we're seeing now is resume building. The res resume in the old days, when I was an employment specialist, we still focused a lot on face-to-face -face handwritten or hand-typed resumes that you would look at and make a decision based off that. Well, in today's age, we have computer uh, programs that file through like indeed.com, that type of thing. They just file through those resource, those resumes and they key on certain words. And if you don't have those words in your resume in the correct order, they don't pull you. So we've got to make sure that the resumes are developed to fit the new de data collection systems. Participating in outreach and coordinating of, of, of job fairs. You need to be present. You need to have your, your face out there and about. So as we as we start to go into this and we look at the role of the VR counselor, we can start to see some carryover happening, meshing of the two roles. It's it's easy to, to mix those two together and it's frustrating to try and separate the two, especially when you're the VR counselor getting told now you have to go do another layer of work. So let's talk about the role of the VR counselor. The VR counselor works to ensure that everyone involved in the case understands the identified disability and how it impacts employment. That's an ongoing discussion from the from the point of your intake when you're when you're taking your application and you're developing that rapport. That point on, that's where you start talking about how this di disability impacts the individual. What characteristics are individualized for that that participant? because we can't assume that, that all disabilities affect everybody the same. They have to identify appropriate job goals, an appropriate job goal based on the participants' grade eight. We have to make sure that we keep you know, their, their interests involved. Informed choice has to be part of this. We work with the participant to, to determine what services are needed, what limitations are there. What do they bring to the table? But what can, as, as a VR counselor, what can we do to help remove that barrier? <clears throat> helps arrange the services. You become kind of the, the, the case manager at that point, making sure all the services are in place. You assist the participant in securing and maintaining employment. So once they once you do help them get that, that job, how do we help them stay there? What are some of the tips and, and tricks that you guys have to, to help those individuals feel comfortable enough to maintain that position? We also have to utilize existing information that we gather during the eligibility determination to make sure that we are putting this individual into an employment setting that is cohesive and collaborative with the disability abilities and limitations. We have to do no harm in, in helping these individuals gain employment. So we can't place somebody with a back injury into a heavy lifting position. 
where they could re-injure themselves. That ethically, that's just not that's not appropriate. We have to utilize information provided by the participant and the participant's family. So we got to make sure that we're talking to everybody. You know, there's there's a lot of times when I get information from the uh, participant's wife or husband that they wouldn't tell me, but the the, the spouse would because they they're concerned about the safety of their their partner. Utilize we have to utilize the most integrated setting. This is something that we always have to make sure that we're not putting these participants into a sheltered work experience or um, an inappropriate setting. And then we have to interpret findings with the participant. So when, when, when I say that, what does that bring to mind? You know, there, there's so much language and jargon out there that we use even for um, newbies that are entering Avers projects now. We, we say all these alphabets and people are like, what does that mean? The participants in the same position, they don't understand a lot of the language we have. So if we're talking about a labor market analysis, it sounds really scary when all we're doing is saying, what jobs are in our community? So it's really how we interpret that finding and help that individual understand what is happening in that process. We have to coordinate the purchases and make sure that the services are, are complete. We, uh, we integrate information from the comprehensive rehab plan or the IPE. We look at that whole, that whole process as, as, a, as one unit and, and it's a continually growing and guiding living discussion that takes place. And like I just said a little bit ago, we have to relay the information in an understandable manner. Okay, so I've already spent about 12 minutes or so talking. So now it's your turn. I got some questions up here that I want to get your feedback on. So please take your mic off. Tell me what you think. Or if you're really scared, maybe you got a little froggy voice going on today. You can put it in the chat box. Well, <clears throat> this is Rita. Um, how about you, we uh, focus on, you know, maybe um, a couple of these things that you talked about. Um, because you talked about a lot. You talked fast, actually, too. Um, so um, why don't you ask us a question that that will help us out? Okay. So what are your thoughts on the roles and responsibilities of an employment specialist? Well, personally, what I see myself doing, I'm not saying it's right, but what I see myself doing is letting them know what's out there. So um, a, twice a month, we have a Zoom um, meeting with the labor department, local labor department. So we're, we know what's going on and we know what jobs are available from low skilled to high skilled. And I just, you know, make available to clients the information and say, hey, you know, um, there's this apprenticeship opening up, it's free. Are you interested in that? Also, there's some jobs over here, this type of employment. What do you think? So I don't know, that's just what I do. I, I let them know what's available. Great, thank you. Anybody else? I think our role and responsibility is all of it especially if you're a small program, you don't have all of the, the titles needed, but we're doing the complete job. So um, we, like Rita, we, we know what our labor market looks like. Um, we share with our clients what's going on, what's open. We ask them to go out and do some research on what you know the job looks like. So we want them as informed as they can be as well come back with questions. And then um, we work through the discovery process, which is understanding what their strengths 
their wants and desires for that job would be or any job. And then we start looking at what's out there and what's available and what fits with their ability and strengths. Um, I think that we always speak in their language. So we're, we're talking to people where they're understanding what that job is and what the labor market looks like. And I think it's the responsibility of us to take care of that no matter where we are in our programs. I'm a program manager. Um, I still need to be able to be active and knowledgeable about what's happening in my community within the employment sector. I need to be able to work right along with Janine on um, talking to employers and seeing what their needs are. A lot of times I do it backwards. We find employers, what their needs are, what their entry level looks like, as well as their management level. So the whole scope of their business. So we can get people ready if that's what they're looking for and help them be more successful in their interview and in the employment. We had an employment specialist. We had a job developer position in our first grant. Um, and we just absorbed that into the next grant. We just have case managers and, and the program manager. And part of the duties of the case manager is working with employers as well as my work is working with employers. Great, thank you, Susie. <clears throat> Anybody else? I, want to? Um, I have one. I, so my thing is I'm trying to, way back when we used to have a job coach developer, um, that position kind of dwindled out why I don't know. It would have been so helpful now, especially because I'm the only one here as a VR tech. <laughs> so I'm really in my mind, I'm like, I've been here for so long and I'm like, I know what this program needs. I know the collaboration it needs as far as tarot. So to me, that's my starting point because we have not worked with local employers here on the reservation. You know, they, for some strange reason, they always, you know, go to school and then they don't return but we after school we leave it up to them to do the job search you know we go through the resume writing and and whatnot but as far as you know local i i see you know we're actually getting older um applicants like say in their 60s who want to do something where you know they don't want to interrupt their ssdi but they still want to, you know, do something. And so my only thing is, you know, local, but I don't know how to approach our tarot. You know, everything is geared like, well, that's a liability. And so that's my fear of like, okay, how am I going to ask and answer their questions? Like, well, what can we do? Or what, um, or what would be my comeback as far as to say, okay, well, according to, you know, this and this and this, um, you know, not using the liability. And I, I'm trying to remember back um, during the week we were in Phoenix, you know, um, because we're sovereign too. So I, I, I'm, I'm trying to, like you said, that, um, that approach um, of what to say when, I, when I'm going to these employers and especially Taro, because I, I think we could benefit a lot from, you know, Taro. Well, in, in a little bit, we're going to get some tips and techniques that might help you. Awesome. So stay tuned. We'll get a couple questions here in the chat box or statements. Um, Naomi is saying that our native corporation, NANA, has a shareholder relations coordinator office in each of our 11 villages um, that we can have our participants work with. Each office has a shareholder computer for them to work on. Their resumes, job searches, and applying for jobs. So that's that's pretty cool. You got that opportunity to have a connection in all your villages. And the focus is on education, training, and employment, and working with our shareholders, which are regional tribal members. Okay, good. Awesome. All right. So the working alliance is what I'm talking about when I talk about roles and responsibilities and the crossover. We have to have three components 
when we to make up that working alliance. We have to have goals. And, and remember that the alliance is also including the participant. We don't get to tell them what to do. They have informed choice and they get to have a say in what is happening and what they are pursuing. So goals are established and agreed upon that address the participant's motivation and seeking rehab services. Then we have to have tasks and responsibilities of both the participant and the counselor. And it has, to, and again, I, I can't stress this enough, that it has to be developed in a collaborative manner. They, they have to be involved in this process. One, legally, we have to do informed choice. Two, you won't get any buy-in if an individual is forced into something that they aren't wanting to do. If they are engaged in, in sharing in this process, you're gonna get that, that participant buy-in, which is gonna make the placement and the development a lot easier. And then we have to have a, a bond that describes the nature of the relationship and it includes differing levels of trust and attachment. So again, that rapport and trust is very important that we started developing that intake and throughout the process of the IPE development, it continues into the, into the development of the job position. You have to have that trust and rapport with that participant. So let's talk about when could support be needed. There, there's several items on this screen that are all really good points of support. But I wanna hear from you guys. Where, where do you think outside of this list on the, on the screen, would you need to support your participant? Um, this is Shanina here. I feel like um, where in our program, um, I have been working for our program for about six, seven months. And so our counselor is out on, on medical leave. So I have to step in and work with the participants. And so you know, just in answering this question, I feel like um, one of the ways that we can support them is like helping them, you know, for this one participant is helping them to become more job ready. Um, like right now, just um, helping them with like resume building, interviewing, um, interviewing skills, and then just providing classes to help them become more um, job ready. Um, yeah, just, yeah, just providing them with the, the support that they need to make them like a, a robust, I guess, applicant for when they do apply for jobs. Great. Thanks for sharing. Hello, this is Antoinette in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. We have what we call a skills lab that we uh, put together for our consumers to utilize um, on a daily basis if they would like. Um, building their reading, writing skills, typing skills, um, soft skills. We're working with resume writing and the interviewing skills. We bought a compu uh, computer and a huge screen TV so that they can see themselves mock interviewing. And so we want to help them develop their confidence and their um, maybe their... Uh, I want to call them soft skills, uh, professionalism before they apply for their jobs, because otherwise they end up getting fired and back at square one in the skills lab. That's what we've been trying. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll get more into the uh, soft skills in uh, the next webinar, which is July 20th, and that's going to be specifically for job placement. Um, because soft skills really fit that section well. Thank and you. Like you were just talking about, it's needed to keep that position. I have a question um, from the last uh, person who was making comments. I don't see their their name. Um, is there a specific program that your clients use to learn about how to put a resume together? No, there's not a specific program that we have. We have uh, purchased um, 
um, programs such as uh, career cruising. They have um, different aspects of resume writing. And then we have the Technomedia. Those are for our reading and writing skills and computer skills. So there are just various programs that we're having load onto our skills lab computers that they could use. Oh, that sounds great. This last week, I probably was, I had a client just like walk in unexpectedly. And um, I spent um, a lot of time with him because he had no clue on how to use the computer at all. I'll look into those um, programs. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, this is Karen um, in, with uh, Verna in Northwest Wisconsin. And we utilize um, a lot of resources through Workforce Resource. Um, and they are located in the jobs, uh, the uh, you know, Wisconsin Employment Offices. And they have, um, they do a lot of resume writing. A lot of it really just depends upon what the consumer is able to access in regards to transportation. Um, I will help um, if necessary, I'll get them started and I'll help them write the resume. But we're also using our local libraries for um, the computer classes because they have free online classes or you can go in person. Um, and so we try and utilize the resources available to us. I don't have um, a, a tribal, um, you know, like job coach or job developer. So um, I have to keep in mind, um, you know, my time and what I can do and what I can also um, get other experts in the community to help with. One of the things I've been trying to work on with um, tribal and casino human resources is recognizing that they are a, a disability friendly employer and trying to work with them to provide um, some program events that will um, teach soft skills and teach job retention. And so I think that there's a lot of things that we can do um, utilizing some of the resources around us, but also working with our own HR departments. Thanks, Karen. In the chat box, Rachel says, uh, we have a position of employment specialist, but it has been vacant and was recently reduced to part-time contract position. Um, she's thinking about contract outside of the tribe with an actual company that provides employment specialists or job coaches rather than doing the direct contract with an ES individually. You know, that that's an option. Um, when I, and I haven't been in the state VR in a long time, so these numbers might be off a little bit, but when I was working with the state, the, the uh, um, individuals or the companies that we worked with were charging $69 an hour to provide that, uh, that employment specialist service. And I don't know a lot of Avers projects that have the budget to accommodate that over a long term. So that's something maybe if you can figure out a way to, to negotiate, then that might be an option. Um, and then with the rural setting, I found that to be a huge barrier for, for me as well. It was 100 miles one, one direction to have an employment specialist come out to service the community that I was the project was located in. So we're talking 200 miles round trip, just travel, not to mention driving around the local community trying to find that. And they were paid that $64 or $69 an hour uh, for travel time as well. So we're looking right off the top, four hours of travel just to get to the community and home. So it just wasn't a feasible option, um, but it, it, it is out there if you're in a, in a community that has that potential. Susie, you said we, we can support through any of the steps. You're right. And one thing is the documentation needed for employment. So seeking out you know, birth certificates or, or any of those other legal documents that are required to gain employment, we can definitely help with that. 
And then Naomi, we are still working on educating our regional employers along with our communities. Once things open up from um, more from COVID, we'll be able to work closer with them. You're right. Uh, this is a huge piece of development in the employment setting is, is educating our employers on what is there because that a lot of those those uh, stigmas that I had mentioned earlier in the beginning of the power or the, of the webinar are perpetrated by the employer. Um, I remember I was I was developing one position with an employer, and this is the, the phrase that was given to me: "I can't hire them." because I will lose business because I, they will be drooling on my burgers. And that was, uh, that was a tough one to swallow. That was, I, I was, um, I, I, I exited pretty quickly before I lost my uh, professionalism because the individual I was placing was autistic and my, my oldest son is autistic. So it was very, it was a very close to home situation. But uh, anyways, Susie. I see you have your, your mic on. Yeah, we um, also partner with the YTP program in, in the high schools for our youth. We don't serve anyone under 18, but we provide outreach starting at 17, 16, 17. So we're part of the school career plan with those youth. Nice. Um, State VR is working in the schools. You know, we're, we're not designated as tribes to do that for tribal VR, but the schools and the state programs, there's a mandate with the state programs. So for job development, um, a lot of times between the school and the state, the job development piece is taken care of. And then we will support after 18 and they are in our program, we support them with job coaching. We um, have been real successful in doing those pieces. So we each take a piece of it and we kind of make it where it's equitable to work Employers know it's going to be both the state, the school, and the tribe. So we've made those relationships and inroads. So it's just being open, creative, and trying to figure out who's going to take what piece of the pie so your program doesn't take all the cost if you are close enough to, to do that. And I know a lot of people aren't. So we're fortunate here to be rural, but not extremely rural. All right. That's a great example of collaborative work. So Anita uh, threw a, a question in the chat box. If you guys jump in there, please read it and respond to her. She's asking for uh, some ideas. I'm gonna keep moving forward because we are on a on a time frame. This isn't the face-to-face -face training where, where I could sit around and talk to you for eight hours. <laughs> so I gotta keep moving forward. That was a good training. That was fun. I'm, I'm, I really appreciate the people that did show up because we had a lot of fun. And uh, we're going to be offering those more now that travel restrictions are starting to lessen. So be watching for that. One part of development that we always get questions on is the, is the disclosure piece. As an employer, we have to talk about um, the, the specific requirements of that individual. As an advocate placing that individual or as a professional placing that individual, we have some guidelines that we have to follow. And it's a discussion that we have to have with the participant because in a lot of situations, the advocate is present but not doing the talking for the participant. We wanna empower that individual to do this on their own, to have that, that success of their own. And so in doing that, we have to have the discussion about disclosures. And we want to frame it to where the individual understands that you describe yourself by the, by the qualifications, not by your disability. And I mentioned that in the beginning of how that mindset is. You know, we, we start looking for employment, we start developing based on limitations. And I wanna challenge you all to shift that and start building on their abilities. When you, when you focus on the limitations in developing an employment position, you start putting people into those, those categories of jobs that are everybody with a disability works in. So when I was working with individuals with this developmental disabilities, they were all lobby attendants at fast food, or they're all laundry assist attendants at the hotels. They're, they didn't have a real um, high-end job because everybody just put them in those positions. So I, I'm, that was because they were basing it off of their limitations and not the abilities that individual brings to the table. So 
just keep that in your mind as you're moving forward through development. We, uh, when, we're when we're doing disclosure, we want to articulate and demonstrate how that individual can perform the essential functions of the job. We don't talk about what's keeping them from doing a job. We talk about these skills that they do have. We don't volunteer negative information. I had one person that was just, I call it emotionally vomiting on people. They would just sit down and tell them about their entire history of negative activities with employment. And, I, and I'd always, we'd get done and I'd be like, you know what, man, guess what? You just sold yourself out of a job. Instead of selling yourself into it, you sold yourself out the door. And we, it, it just, it's a tough situation because there's some people that that is how they identify themselves as. So helping empower them to recognize that they aren't their disability, that the disability limitations and characteristics help build who they are, but they are not that disability. Avoid medical terms or, or human service jargon. Um, this, this sometimes scares employers. Like we were talking about the education piece. Uh, a lot of our employers, they are this, the people that, that create the stigmas or, or, or follow the stigma pattern. Emphasize current positive activity instead of always staying in the past of what used to happen. Talk about what's happening now, what skills you've developed, how you how you've moved forward, how this individual has mastered some of the soft skills that are needed to be in customer service type situations. Emphasize that, that you are in charge and control. That's what you want that individual, that participant to feel. They want to, we want them to feel that they have that control and that ability to um, take control of their, their future. And it's funny because Susie mentioned that create, they get creative in their approach to serving people and that's very key. Creativity is key in development. You have to be able to think outside the box, right? Everybody, everybody thinks, oh, let's go get them, a, let's go get them a job, let's fill out an application, let's do this job or that job, and and we have to look at the abilities. What does that individual bring to the table, and how can we make that fit into that employer's need? What other services are available in the community? Is there people out there that can support them one step further than you? Is there people out there that, is there agencies out there that can provide some of the funding to, to provide this additional requ uh, training requirement or service or skills development? Are there any gaps in, this, in these services? So when you start looking at your, your placement or your development of, of, in an employment setting, what pieces are missing in that employment setting that you can help fill? What are the gaps to help that individual move into competitive community employment? What services do not exist that the community could use? So we're talking about maybe some self-employment stuff, working from home. I saw the chat that was going through the or the string the the string of chats. What because you what could your community use that this individual brings to the table? When I was working with an individual, we were developing a self-employment plan. Uh, she's living on the res. Her idea was to, to do um, dog sitting and, and, and kenneling and dog grooming. And when I first heard that, like many of us maybe on this call, I started laughing and I looked around. I'm like, who's going to bring a res dog in to get a bath? <laughs> like, I, I just can't, I couldn't picture res dogs coming in to get a bath. And, and she got and we had a good relationship, so she could really get snappy. And I'm not going to say what she said back to me because that's not appropriate in this setting. But she said, you need to focus. And you need to focus on the small dogs like mine. And she had a little chihuahua. And she babied this chihuahua. And there's a lot of people that have those house pets. And the business became very successful because she filled that niche. Everybody had res dogs, but the people that had those, those lap dogs and those little toy dogs they didn't have any place to take them that those res dogs wouldn't eat them. So <laughs> she was able to provide that safety net. What skills, abilities, capabilities, and desires does the participant have? This is so overlooked. I can't, I can't state it enough. We, we get into this groove where we're going to save this person and they have to work in this job and we're going to make sure that they're successful that we forget to ask them, what do you want to do? So we got to always stay in that mindset. What does that individual want to do? What do they bring into the table? And how can we, how can we help them build their, their toolbox of skills? 
Well, we do that through person-centered planning. And you know, this term gets thrown around a lot. And what does it mean? When we talk about person-centered planning, what does it mean? Well, it means that we help a person identify their needs. A lot of our people that we work with have never been allowed the opportunity to look at themselves in a positive light. They've been told that they're too stupid or they don't have any skills or they don't have the ability to, to do whatever is needed. And person-centered planning allows them that opportunity to grow and expand and identify themselves. It allows us to identify employment options that fit well with the job seeker's personal vision. Again, if they don't buy in, they're not gonna be successful. We, we will have this uh, recidivism take place, the revolving door. We've all have that, that, that participant that's been in our programs, you know, 15 times and we can't, we can't seem to close the deal. So the next time that person comes in, I encourage you to step back and be like, what did we miss? What is keeping them from buying into what I'm selling? Guiding and supporting the individual. We're not an expert on that individual. Their disabilities impact them individually. We cannot come in with our expert hat on and wave our magic wand around and make people better. It doesn't work. We have to engage their support systems. And if they don't have a support system, we help them develop it. That's that person-centered approach, making that person the center, the core of their group. And then the multicultural issues, that, that's so huge. When, when we talk about sovereignty, that's one layer. But then we talk about cultural, traditional. Those are two more layers. We have to take all those things into account, especially if we're working within a, on a border town or wanting people to be able to um, progress outside of, uh, outside of, of the, the small limited employment pool that you have. All right, Albert put in the chat box, uh, I was in one of the villages we served when I got word from the tribe that a former consumer was a good welder and there was a desperate need for one in the community. I contacted the individual and reopened them in the new IP and self-employment as a welder. It was very successful. That's a great, great story of thinking outside the box and being flexible enough to adapt to the situation. So, all right, so the next slide I hear is a great, um, video I found and I, I'm just going to play it and let you guys listen to it. It's about 11 minutes long, but it's, it's, it's important that we look at it from this perspective. When you have a job that pays you enough to cover your basic needs, your bills, and even some more to spend, the assumption is that you'd be happy or even better fulfilled. And it seems unthinkable when you wake up and say you're going to leave a job like that to pursue a passion. And that was my dilemma six years ago. I had a comfortable job. I lived a comfortable life. And people expected me to be fulfilled, but I wasn't. There was something in me that wanted more. There was a misalignment between the things I did on a daily basis and the things that I deeply cared about. And so I decided to quit and explore the possibility of bringing this passion into my daily routine. And the thing about finding your passion is that it's not straightforward. Even for people with money and degrees, they still struggle to identify their passion. And here I was as a 30 year old talking about finding my passion and turning it into a career. Literally, people told me, you don't talk about passion until you've made enough money. <laughs> or at least until you're ready to retire. Because there's a notion that looking inward and finding the things that give us pleasure and fulfillment is a luxury that only the rich can enjoy. Or a pleasure that only the retired can indulge in. Which made me wonder, is passion only for the rich? or an experience only the retired can enjoy. For many of us, we've been made to believe that life is a race of survival. We've been conditioned to see ourselves as survivors that must do everything in our power to survive. 
in Africa. We now have to go through school, cram and pass, in the hope that you get a job after. And if you do, stick at it no matter how much it sucks. <laughs> Until you get a better offer or you're asked to retire. And as a dropout, I knew that I was not entitled to anything. Every opportunity was a privilege. And so when I thought about quitting, it was a huge risk. I've given two alternatives, which are the most popular in Africa. The first one is sign up for any course at a vocational institution and do it. My second option, set up for any job offer you can get, no matter the working conditions, and do it. That probably explains why we have so many of our young people being trafficked in such a greener pastures. I opted for the first option. I did look at a couple of vocational institutions in the hope that I would find a course that resonated with my persona, my dream, and my aspiration. I was disappointed to learn that there was no room for misfits like me in this institution. The education system in many parts of the world has been designed around pre-selected options that young people are expected to fit in or risk becoming misfits. And so going through school as nurtured and conditioned to think in the straight line and stay within the straight line. But when I dropped out, I discovered a world of possibilities. I knew I could be anything. I could study anything. And so I leveraged free online courses. That's how I built my CV. Got into employment and worked for eight years. And after eight years, I told myself there must be more to life than just going through the routines of life. So in 2014, I started an organization called CHUSA, where we're working with out of school youth and empowering them to turn their passion into profitable, scalable, and sustainable businesses. Now, when we talk about passion, one of the most common questions that people ask is, what is passion? How do I even find it? And in the simplest definition, passion is a collection of your life experiences that give you the deepest sense of fulfillment. And to identify your passion, you need to look inward. So we use two reflective questions. The first question we ask is, if you had all the time and the money in the world, what would you spend your time doing? It sounds like a very simple question, but many people struggle to answer this question because they've just never thought about it. The second question we ask is, what makes you happy or gives you the deepest sense of fulfillment? Now, you would assume that we all know what makes us happy. But it's also interesting to note that so many people have no idea what makes them happy. <laughs> because they're so busy going through the routines of life, they've never stopped to look inward. And so identifying the things that give us a deep sense of fulfillment and the things that give us deep joy are thoughts that begin to direct us in the direction of our person. And just in case you're wondering what your answers are to those two questions, I invite you to sit with these questions later and just reflect about it. However, I am also aware that passion alone cannot guarantee success in life. And I should note that not every passion can become a career. For passion to become a career, it must be coupled with the right set of skills, conditioning, and position. So when we get our young people to look inward, we also ask them, what skills do you have? What talents do you have? What experience do you have that you can use to build a niche in the marketplace? But more than that, we also look at the market trend because it doesn't matter how much you love and enjoy it. If nobody wants it or is willing to pay for it, it can't be a career. It's just a hobby. And the third thing we look at is how do you position yourself? Who are you targeting? Who do you want to sell to? Why would they want to buy from you? And so the combination of the three is what enables you move from just a person to a business. And many of our young people have been able to turn their ideas and burning desires into profitable businesses or social enterprises. And they're not just creating jobs, but they are solving societal challenges. I'll share with you two examples. One of them is Esther. I met Esther two years ago. She had been out of school for two years. And she had been deeply affected by her dropping out. As a result, she had experienced severe depression to a point where she attempted to take her own life several times. Her friends and family didn't know what to do for her. They simply prayed for her. 
When I met Esther and I started to converse with her, I asked her a simple question. I said, if you had all the time and the money in the world, what would you do? Without thinking or hesitation, her eyes lit up and she began to tell me how she wanted to change the lives of young people. She wanted to restore hope and dignity to other teenagers by helping them make informed decisions about life. I was certain of the fact that this burning desire in her was unquenchable. And so we worked with Esther to put a framework around this desire. Today, she runs a social enterprise in her village, raising awareness about substance abuse, mental health, sexual reproductive health, and is helping other school dropouts acquire vocational skills so they can make a living for themselves. Esther turned 20 this year. And for the last two years, She's organized an annual teen fest that brings together over 500 teenagers. Young people that are able to network and collaborate on different projects, but more importantly, to meet professionals that would otherwise never have met. This is all engineered by a girl that believed the world had no room for her, that without education should never amount to anything. But by looking inward and tapping into a burning desire, putting structure around it, it has become a model that not only changed her life, but is transforming the lives of hundreds of young people every year. My other example is Musa. Musa is a natural artistic guy. He's the kind that will look at any design and replicate it with ease. And so his sister recognized that ability in him. When I met Musa, he was doing all kinds of crap, but belt, wallet, but it was more of a part-time thing. Or sometimes if it was really broke and needed to make quick money, then he would come up with a design and sell it. But he had never thought of it as a business. We started working with Musa, helping him shift his mindset from a hobby to a business and beginning to rethink how can you make products that he could sell and even be able to scale. Musa makes some of the most amazing bags I've ever seen. And over the last one year, Musa's business has grown. He has been recognized in different places. Currently, he's talking about exporting to developed countries. Musa, like any other dropout, believed that without academic credentials, he wouldn't amount to anything. He thought the talent he had was nothing simply because he did not have an academic paper to define him. But by looking inward and finding that what he, wa he had was the greatest asset and supporting him to turn it into a business, He's not just living, he's thriving. The thing about looking inward is that it can be scary, especially if you're doing it for the first time. But the truth is you never truly start living until you learn to live from the inside out. And in unlocking potential, we need to look inward to identify the things that give us a deep sense of fulfillment, the things that give us the deepest joy and then weave them into the patterns of our daily routine. In so doing, we cease to work and we start to live. And the thing about living is that you never have to retire or to resign. <laughs> and so as we think about unlocking potential for ourselves, for our young people, for our children, let's not condition them to look outward but condition them to look inward, to tap into who they are and bring that self into what they do every day. When you cease to work and you live, when passion becomes a career, you don't just excel, you become unstoppable. Thank you. All right. What'd you guys think about that video? Awesome. How does it connect to what we were talking about with working alliances or the creativity piece? Um, a lot of our clients, so, Native Crafts is a small business and um, they can't keep up with the orders. So there's, there's this relationship of them selling locally to Alaska Natives because 
Alaska Natives know the value of warm winter clothing. You know, when you're sewing with furs and you're making um, boots or parkas or fur hats or fur mittens. Um, I mean, we know cold like no other place. You know, we have a dry climate and it often gets, you know, 50, 60 below. Yes, and yes, people send their kids to school when it's that cold. <laughs> They'll walk to school because the buses won't run, right? But but um, in the villages, they all the kids go to school. I, I used to teach out in the villages as a as a teacher. Um, so they're doing something they love to do, and and. People want to buy it, and there's like a resurgence of sewing real clothing. Okay, it's just not all beadwork, although there is beadwork on this beautiful clothing. So um, there is a desire among young people and middle-aged people to get back to. Um, this um, subsistence skill. It gets people excited, especially young people. They're like, wow, I really wanna learn this. Um, and I'm just telling you, this is a desire among a lot of Alaska natives, not just our clients. So when our clients can do this, they're fulfilling a need and um, they enjoy learning. So we set them up with a, um, some of them know what they're doing already, but uh, we often set them up with a mentor. Thank you. Who has, who's uh, ever assisted with uh, a participant disclosing their disabilities and then requesting accommodations? Has anybody ever experienced that? It's Philip Albert. Could you hear me? Yes. I had the same consumer in Southern comment before, and he had uh, mobility problems because of his back. And uh, he, you know, he couldn't walk around very well and it shot. So I kind of looked around and uh, found a, a swivel chair that uh, the dental clinic was discarding. And I got a hold of him and asked him if that would work. And he said, yes, you know, it had wheels on it. So he can just wheel around in each shop. And so, he came and picked it up, and I guess it worked well. Thank you. That, that's a great example of a, of a really low-tech accommodation, a swivel chair, so you can move around and scoot around. That's perfect. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about some job search strategies. When we start, part of development is getting out and, and doing that search and finding open positions. And there's going to be... I'm not going to read through all of these. The, 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 the PowerPoint stuff will be available as they all are in the uh, AWU. You'll find the links. So I'm not going to go through every one of these things, but I'm going to do the, I'm going to talk about some of the, the headings here. What is the job market for your community? Again, knowing what's out there and who's hiring. Um, what's the process for finding a job? How do you do that? What do you have to do to the steps to take to get into that position to find them and, and to, then complete the application and get going forward. Um, there may, you know, there's different types of career exploration. Once you go out and do the job search and you find open positions or you know the available positions, maybe your participant wants to explore a little bit. What, what's, 
what do each career opportunity entail? What what experiences do they need to have? What what abilities do they have to have, present with? So you can do interv inter informational interviewing. That's where you set up a job interview with that with that potential employer and have your participant ask them questions. Community exploration. They go out in the community. They look around. What jobs are there? As they go get groceries, you you ask them to observe who's working in what position, where. Maybe the gas station, the, the you know the the grocery store, the college, the whatever's in your community. They observe those people working to find out if it if there's any interest in those positions. Job shadowing. So they find that position that's interesting, but they don't know if they really could do it. So then they go in and, and they do a deeper dive. You go in and job shadow. You work with, you, they, they would observe somebody that's working in that position. They would follow them throughout the work day and see if it's something that they are really truly interested in. Job tours, similar to job shadowing, except for you're not following one participant or one, one employee, excuse me. You, you on a job tour, you would have a, a tour of all of the different job opportunities in that employer setting. Company research, going out and finding out, you know, what companies are available in your community that then the participant can go through and research what they provide the community, what type of benefits they have, what's the management style, what are, you know, all those different types of, of in, information that they can fall or find through community company researching. Labor market research, again, this, when we started saying some of that stuff, it gets kind of scary. So we'd look at, you know, what's, what jobs are in the community what's available for, you know, for you to apply at or to pursue. You just would look through, the participant would go look through the community and maybe there's some, you know, the tarot office we mentioned earlier, they might have a list of job opportunities that the individual could look at and see what's available and how it's growing. One-stop career center. So if you are within a rural uh, community that has a WIOA workforce center, available on your reservation this is a great opportunity or if you're in a border town or a border there's you have a border town that has an office like this you could go and have that individual work with people there to, to look at all the different training and job opportunities that are available through the workforce departments or one-stop centers taking a class go to adult ed there maybe there's a pottery class or like here in, in montana with the local adult ed that I, I we have in our community, they do um, like journal entries and and um, journaling and um, I just lost the word. When the thing when you when you take pictures and you put them in a journal, I can't <laughs> I can't believe I lost the word. Anyways, it's one of those things they do. Leather, scrapbooking. Thank you. Rachel came through with the save. <laughs> yeah, so scrapbooking, um, leatherworking, pottery, all those types of things are available for us here. And then the one thing that VR, the Avers projects can do is a situational assessment. So you could do a community-based assessment or a trial work experience as a way to, to figure out what that person is interested in and if there's any any you know, strong interest for them to participate in finding that employment. Okay, so again, now we're at a point where you guys get to jump in, share your thoughts on the types of job searches you have engaged in with a participant. Out of the types that I listed, have you guys done any of those types of, of things? This is Naomi. So far, the only one that I've really um touched on a bit was janitorial and they did a, a short-term work experience um not through our program but um they never called him back and i guess they said that he wasn't um doing the duties fast enough for them okay so you did the the trial work experience Anybody else have any other that they've tried? We've provided um, services to our hotel with a um, client that really wanted to work at the casino. 
got a job at the hotel, um, had a working interview because they weren't able to do the regular type of interview, the verbal one. They weren't real verbal. So we did a working interview. They got the job. No supports were be able to be in place at that point because it's at the casino. So um, it wasn't working out well for them. They weren't quick enough to be in the rooms because their disability was if they were they're artistic and they needed everything perfectly done. Well, it's not fast enough for the casino. So we were able to ask if there were other jobs that um, would would work in this piece. They put him out um, cleaning the open areas. So he's doing halls, he's doing wiping windows, doors, working in the lobby. And he has been successful. He um, had a year of retention in February, loves his job. They plan on keeping him and it opened the door for us to go back. So it's, it's looking at the strengths of this person, understanding that his eye of detail was really what they needed for the open spaces where people are coming and going more than the room. And janitorial is what he did want to do. I mean, this is what he loves to clean and organize. So this is where he wanted to be. So we were, we were lucky in understanding and knowing that we had to be there all the way, even though we can't be inside with the sports we were checking in on with this person weekly or his family weekly to see how it was going. We asked the employer what we could do to make sure that he retained the employment and it worked out well. Hi, I'd like to add to that. Go ahead, Anita. Hi, this is Antoinette from Menominee Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, we also had experiences at our casino where individuals weren't working fast enough so we um, collaborated a meeting with management and we trained management to work with individuals with disabilities, give them jobs they can succeed in, work at their level, not the individual working at the casino's level. And we had to help managers understand that they have a workforce here to tap into. They need to learn to work with us. And they took that to heart and they started working with many individuals they're one of our referrals to uh, work at their level. And we're hoping to do that at other employers in our area is um, have them work at our level. In addition, I think there's a huge program in Wisconsin Dells, the Kalahari has a whole department of individuals who live with disabilities, work in a specific department and they give jobs to every one of them that they can succeed at and then if it's if it's just folding towels, they fold towels. So that's what I'm hoping to uh, tap into in our area. Thanks. Thank you. That's a great example of, of educating an employer and working with them. All right, so some employment development tools. There's so many different tools out there. It's really, there's no cookie cutter. There's no magic wand. There's no this is gonna work for everybody type tool. So it's, it's, it's good to have a toolbox full of these different things that are available for you to utilize with your individuals. Transferable skills list is huge. That one's a really easy one to sit down and, and work with on your, with your participant, but it's one that we overlook a lot. In, interest inventory, abilities list, limitation. One of mine, I, I really like doing with, with participants is the dream job versus the nightmare job because it gives me that full spectrum of, of what that individual is really looking for and what that individual absolutely will refuse to do. So that baseline is really important when I'm developing that position. So methods for contacting employers. There's always a send a letter of inquiry with a resume. It's important to include that resume because we wanna give them the greatest opportunity to get to know our individual right away. They haven't had you know, 90 days to develop the rapport that we have. So we want them to be able to get a good snapshot of the abilities this individual's bringing. Telephone calls, walk-in, follow-up. I mean, that's, that's just basic stuff. Going back and hitting the pavement and knocking on doors of, of employers. 
business relationships and networking. When you're developing this stuff, it's so important that you have a, a knowledge of the employers in your area. It's so important to have a knowledge of the contact within those employers so that you can develop that rapport and relationship with them. So eventually they will be reaching out to you saying, hey, do you have anybody with these skill sets? I need some people. When, when businesses start to seek Avers projects for employment, we've reached our goal of, of really developing that relationship with those employers. Okay, so we're getting close to the end. And let's talk about some takeaways here. Employment opportunities in rural and remote areas such as reservations depend highly on a collaboration between the counselor, participant and the community. Our individuals have a hard time getting out because of the stigma. Again, like I was saying earlier, in many of the cases, they've never been shown the true positive potential they, they possess. They've only been told of all the things they cannot do. So it's that collaboration of empowering that individual to identify and acknowledge their own skill set in moving forward towards employment. It depends, you know, employment really in these rural settings and remote settings depends on the creativity that we can bring to the table. And, and when I'm throwing the creativity net out there, I want everybody involved in that individual's life. I want the participant, I want me, I want their, you know, their family, their support systems. I want everybody talking to me about what we can do to create this individual's potential for employment. Self-employment and subsistence. I'm Wayne. Yeah. I just have a, um, a question or like how you were talking about um, how you want their family or people to be involved. And um, so I know that like, right, you have to have ROIs in order to share information, like if they want to include somebody on that process, like how do you, how do you go about like involving their family? Do you just ask them, like, is it okay if their family is involved in the process or, you know, like what's the best way to go about that? For me, I always did that in a conversation with the participant. I would ask them who they wanted on their support team. Who do you okay. want to bring into the into the group? And from that, I would develop that ROI list and have them agree and sign the ROIs and I could talk to those individuals. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And that also carries over into the placement model, which we'll be doing on July 20th. So um, that I can give you more details. I, I'm not going to give away the secrets because I want you guys to come to the next go round. <laughs> Self-employment is one of those things that a lot of times is really scary for a VR counselor um, and for an Avers project as a whole, because we don't necessarily always understand what that means. Um, there's so many, so many different definitions and, and, and requirements that we just have a tendency to push that aside and move forward, just finding straight employment. I encourage you all to, to, to take a look at it, you know, utilize it more because there's some really good stuff out there that can help your, your remote and rural settings. And don't get stuck on one track. I mean, these people, every disability is dynamic. So our, our response and our, our, our engagement has to be dynamic. We have to be able to meet all of the needs of that individual and, and, the, and the individual's disability characteristics. So flexibility is very, very important. And if you can, I'm a huge, I'm a huge supporter of face-to-face. -face. You know, I know there's a lot of people and, and Karen, you know, you mentioned this in the chat box about employers aren't wanting walk-ins applications you know it absolutely is true and and that happens a lot but i still want to be invested and engaged with the hiring person or the manager i want to have that rapport and that connection with that individual then i can go back when i when i was um sorry i'm i'm jumping thoughts here then i can go back and and work with the 
participant in, in completing the application online. When I was placing people in our community, um, Albertsons, our local grocery store, went strictly online for their application. I got to talk to the hiring manager and the store managers in Billings, and they agreed that that was cutting out a lot, a large uh, applicant pool because there's a lot of people that couldn't do that process. So they actually gave me the answers <laughs> to the to the uh, application personality questionnaire because they wanted more people to get through that process. So the individuals I was working with, when they did the, the online application, I handed them a, a sheet of paper that had all the answers to get them to the interview. Um, kind of under underhanded and maybe not all that that fair, but it still worked. And I can't stress enough working on interview techniques. You know, like I said earlier about the the emotionally uh, vomiting person that would just give up every every type of history that they had or negative history they had. Just working on those techniques, helping that individual sell themselves instead of their activities or their their past experiences. If you get no job offer, be willing to take a temporary position. Anything to get your foot in the door. I can build that individual into a full-time position or part-time position if I can just get them to be present. So that's a discussion I have with a lot of the participants that I used to work with. Okay, we have about seven minutes. Um, if you guys want to do q and I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. Please throw me some questions. You can throw them in the chat box, whatever you want to do. While we're doing that, since we're on the time limit, I'm going to kick you over to the save the date. We have job placement, July 20th, same time, same place. And then we have our talking circle on the August 3rd.